Welcome to session four on the book of Hosea. And I want to just kind of take a little bit of an interlude here and talk to you about what you're doing in your own personal work. Talk to you about your readings and doing your horizontal and your verticals. And then I want to take part of the session and just uh, talk to you about asking the why question of the text because asking the question why is like a bridge that takes you from observation to interpretation. But I want to ask you some questions and I don't want you to be offended by what I ask you, but I just want to be sure that you are kind of keeping up with what you want to be doing. First thing I would ask you, have you done your first reading? And just as a note about your first reading, having traveled around the world for the last many, many years, I often take surveys of churches and schools where I go both inside and outside of YWAM, and I ask them how many of you have, I ask two questions, how many of you have read the whole Bible, and how many of you have read the whole New Testament? And the answers are pretty consistent no matter where I am, no matter the age group of the audience. Less than 20% of Christians around the world have read the whole Bible one time. And when I ask about the New Testament, it's right at about 40% have read the whole New Testament. So if you've done your first reading, you should rejoice because you are in the top 80% of people uh, in the church because no doubt if a person has not read the whole Bible, for sure they have not read Hosea. I've often thought to myself when people get to heaven, and they meet some of these prophets, and the prophets introduce themselves and ask, have you read my book? Uh, for instance, Obadiah, when he meets people in heaven, and people are going to ask him, what book? And the answer, of course, is, you know, that book in the Bible. So if you've done your first reading, you should rejoice and congratulate yourself, and then guess what? Do the second reading. How about your BRI? Have you thought about uh, your basic required information? One thing that you will be interested to know about BRI is actually it was a student who incorporated this originally into the uh, SBS curriculum. It was in 1985-86. Uh, a student in our class came to me at the end of the school year and said, you know, I've decided to do this thing with every book that's really helped me to understand them. He said, I call it basic required information. And that's actually how we began to incorporate BRI into our work. It came from a student. How about your paragraph titles? Have you been doing them? Four words or less, the exact words of the text, preferably words that are all in, in a line close to each other. You want to do your paragraph titles. Paragraph titles are important. You know, I memorized the whole book of Titus one time just, just by my paragraph titles. Uh, Titus is different, of course, than Hosea. You've got 197 verses in Hosea, only 46 verses in Titus. But having good paragraph titles really gets you into the book. How about structure? Do you see structure in the book of Hosea? Have you done your rough horizontal? Have you emailed it to whoever your checker is? You've got some wonderful people out there who are volunteering their time and effort and talent to help oversee your work and be sure that you get that to them. So have you started your verticals? And uh, this, is, uh, this is the wonderful part of what we do. We get the big picture and the horizontal. Here's my, by the way, here's my horizontal from 30 years ago. And uh, this was actually the 1981 version of the Hosea horizontal that I did. And notice that I still have it with me in the year 2001, uh, 2011. And I still use it. And uh, not that it's so good that it couldn't stand improvement, but it's probably a combination. I'm just too lazy to redo it. But the good news is that I can teach from it. And here is my Hosea chapters 1 and 2 a vertical, and this is my Hosea 3 vertical, which you'll notice is quite empty, and that has to do with the development of the school. That what you're doing could be compared to a modern supersonic jet, and what I did was the Wright Brothers edition of the SBS. However... I still teach from them. So you want to start your verticals. Now, we want to think through the book a little bit more. I want you to think about the why question. I remember in the old days, this was the question when I was teaching in SBS's regularly in the leading schools for the first 17 years of my time with the SBS. I've been with the SBS now 30 years. I used to constantly encourage students to ask why questions of the text. In fact, when I was introducing the course to people, I'd actually use the word bombard, that people need to bombard the text with why questions. 
And so we want to bombard this text in Hosea with a few why questions, and I just want to put them before you just for your thinking. And you know what? We may not get all the answers as we think through the why questions, but it will stir our thinking to get us back there to interpret. Now, remember, interpretation is actually wondering what it meant to the original reader and to the original uh, writer, to the original hearers. What we're trying to do is reconstruct the circumstance that this book went into. It's not what does it mean to me, it's what does it mean to them. And the way you get there is you ask why. So, in thinking through in chapter 1 and verse 2, why does God ask Hosea to marry a harlot? This is very, I mean, this could take hours and hours. Of, I mean, you could literally just look out a window and think about this because when you think about God asking a prophet to do this, it's almost like somebody puts uh, Dell PC software into an Apple computer. I mean, it just does not compute. Why would God ask this? And I think in some ways that's the point is that God asked this prophet to do something that was so outrageous and so far outside of his realm of thinking that it literally was unthinkable. And I think that that's one of the points in God is that, that his, his thinking about his own people was the kind of thing that they're doing literally is unthinkable. I, it, it just doesn't compute. And so we ask that why question. Why would God ask Hosea to do this? Another question in chapter 2 and verse 14 where God says he's going to allure his people back to him. Chapter 2 and verse 14 uh, God says, therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. And the question we ask is, why, why would God use these words? Why use the word allure? Why would he use the word speak tenderly? Because these are all words, right, that, that, that kind of wrap themselves around the whole idea of a man speaking to his wife. And we think of this idea of alluring, and we think of... God using various measures to, to be attractive to his people, to put before them attractive things. And at the same time, they just, shall we say, refused to be allured by him, that there was something in their heart that they just didn't find God attractive. And when we think of this whole idea of, of God using the word allure, we want to sit there and we want to ask ourselves, wow, you know, what, what we're looking at here is God really trying to get to the heart of the people. That he's wanting not simply to give them commandments and to give them ordinances, but God is really trying to get to their heart. He's trying to touch their affections. And so he says, I'm going to allure her. I'm going to put something in front of her that will be attractive. Now, the unfortunate thing is, as we go through the book, that it was virtually impossible to attract the people of Israel uh, for God himself. And so in chapter 5 and verse 13, God says he was going to be like a lion to them. And why would God use this phrase, like a lion? And I think there's more than one answer to that. Some of it has to do with historical background from both the Assyrians and later the Babylonians, that many of the Assyrian kings, when they used symbols of themselves when you looked around their palaces at the kinds of of artwork that were in the palaces of these kings often lions would be right in the middle of it you go to the British Museum you see a lot of inscriptions of lions well you ask the question why around Assyria and I think the answer is God says I'm going to be like a lion it's going to be like when the king of Assyria comes down and does terrible things to you and these kings did do terrible things they would poke out eyes and pull out tongues and just do terrible things to people like a lion. That lions, there's nothing gentle about a lion when a lion begins to eat its prey. And God says that he's going to be like a lion to his own people. The other thing about God being like a lion to his own people is the contrast here between what we just looked at in God is going to allure her like a husband would put attractive things before his wife to something where there's just absolute hopelessness of even survival and it's just a completely different context where God says alright so if they won't take it when I'm going to be good to them and try to touch their emotions maybe I can strike such fear in them that they will uh, run to me I'll be like a lion to them so we find this question of why he would be like a lion. Then in 8.1 he says another thing. Chapter 8 and verse 1, 
set the trumpet to your lips for a vulture is over the house of the Lord. So now we have a different member of the animal kingdom, a vulture, because they have broken my covenant and transgressed my law. So the question we ask in the why question is why does God say there's a vulture over the house of the Lord? Well, it's a, it's a way of saying there's going to be death here. If you think about vultures circling, the only reason vultures circle is they know that death is around. And God says that the vultures are going to be circling because this is going to get ugly. And so we consider what a, what a picturesque way for this prophet to communicate. Now remember what I said to you at the beginning. Prophets are poets. Prophets are artists. They're not simply prosaic. They don't simply give dull, boring Man, they're not like manuals on how to install software onto a computer. The prophets are artists. And so as a result, they're dramatic. They say things that, are, that, that will stick in your mind. So where Hosea says, you know what, there are going to be vultures cir circling. Well, that's pretty dramatic. So we find in chapter 10 and verse 1, Israel is a luxuriant vine that yields its fruit. The more his fruit increased, the more altars he built. As his country improved, he improved his altars. And so the question we ask there is why? And so you see, you could literally just go through every verse in Hosea and tack a why question onto it. And so you tack this why question onto this verse. Why was it that as Israel got richer, as things got better, their heart got further from God? And it's, a, uh, it's an enigma. It is very difficult to be able to answer that question that you look at this and you think about this question, why would they act this way? And in some ways we sit stunned as we look at this passage in the Bible. Why would they act like this? That the better things got, the further their heart got from God. And there really is no answer. And in chapter 10 and verse 2, the very next verse from this, it I think gives us a little bit of answer to our why question where... God inspires the prophet to write, their heart is false. And so it could be that, that the, the prophet is giving us a little bit of a glimpse into why they behaved the way they did. And that is that their heart was false, that they were totally committed to these idols. And that when they came to the Lord, they didn't speak true words to him. That, that they would say one thing and, and behave some other way. And so you can just go right through... Uh, this book and just ask why questions. Now I want to encourage you as you continue to study the prophets that you really keep this as a high priority when you're moving from observation to interpretation, when you're trying to move back into the original circumstance of the original hearers and of, of the time of the writer that you ask the why question because what the why question does, it turns us into a time traveler where we go back and we can actually ask the kinds of questions that need to be asked of a text. When we come back, we're going to look at chapter 1 and 2, and we're going to think some about application.